So thanks for joining us uh, for this session on the changes and surprises emerging from East Antarctica. Um, my name is Matt King, uh, and I'm the director of the Australian Centre for Excellence in Antarctic Science. Um, I just want to tell you briefly about uh, ACES, as we call it. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large investment from the Australian Research Council where we're trying to understand climate risks emerging from East Antarctica and the Southern Ocean, um, uh, funded out until 2025, uh, hopefully for longer still. And we're focused on um, uh, uh, the physical climate system, but also the marine ecosystem. So we're working on everything from the atmosphere, the ocean, um, the sea ice, um, the land ice, and the solid earth beneath the land ice as well. Um, because we recognise that Antarctica is a coupled system, it's a deeply complex system, uh, and that you can't actually understand where Antarctica is going to go in the future without understanding interactions between those components of the system. There's about 150 people uh, broadly in our team, from experienced researchers uh, to uh, uh, early career researchers, uh, and it's uh, really a great a group of people that I'm working with uh, there. And so I'll be showing some of the work tonight I will be from uh, our team, uh, a lot of it from uh, just the best science that's going on around the world. I want to start with this slide because um, it really does uh, speak to uh, the importance of Antarctica, at least in terms of sea level change. We'll talk about other impacts of Antarctica later on. Um, but um, uh, shown on the, on the graph is um, uh, the amount of sea level that's locked up in Antarctica um, uh, by sort of large drainage basin. And you see here that uh, the, the sectors on the, the left-hand side of the map of West Antarctica, which is the area that, as we'll see, is changing the most dramatically, could contribute about four metres of sea level rise. Um, but the, the, the vast area on the, on the right-hand side from the centre through to the right-hand side of the map um, uh, is the vast an East Antarctic ice sheet, which I'll be paying particular attention to. You add up all those numbers, it's 52 or thereabouts metres of sea level potential. Uh, and the message here is that, is that we just don't want East Antarctica um, uh, moving in the way that uh, West Antarctica is changing because there's just so much ice locked up in um, East Antarctica. Just one of the glaciers, uh, and that's the one uh, that some of our team are actually heading to the field right now to work on is the Denling Glacier. That one glacier has enough sea level in it to uh, ice in it to, to raise sea, sea levels globally by one and a half metres. Uh, I don't know if you've ever stood on the edge of the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean and just stared out over the vastness of that space. And just if you have, just stop and think about what that would feel like to, or what would be required to fill up that ocean by one and a half metres. Yeah, that's just the Denman Glacier. That's just one glacier. We're talking about vast amount of ice that are in these basins uh, and uh, they have tremendous uh, consequences for us. Um, this is a, a graph of the, the current state of play of the changing mass of the ice sheet, and this is the thing that's relevant to sea level. Uh, on, the, on the vertical axis, uh, we see mass change measured in gigatons, that's in billions of tonnes. Um, and we see uh, the wild Greenland is the big changer there from 1992 through to 2021. Um, adding about uh, 5,000 billion tonnes of ice into the ocean that's not replaced by snowfall. Um, we see that Antarctica in the, uh, in the purple line um, has added about almost 3,000 billion tonnes. Um, and if you break that up into the different components of West Antarctica, East Antarctica and the Antarctic Peninsula, you see that all those different areas are playing different roles, uh, West Antarctica being the big changer, um, but and East Antarctica um, perhaps growing slightly, but as we'll see, the overall appearance of East Antarctica is not really an accurate uh, summary of uh, the change that's underway there. Um, just did want to highlight uh, here some of the, um, uh, the different studies that make up some of those uh, consensus estimates that I've shown on the previous figure. Um, and here we see that uh, if you look at, for example, the West Antarctic ice sheet, the waste uh, area, there's three different studies and they all pretty much agree with each other. If you go across to the East Antarctic ice sheet, the EAIS, you see that the studies 
uh, don't particularly agree well. One suggesting significant uh, mass loss, one significant uh, mass gain, and another one suggesting not much is really happening. Um, uh, so that's uh, not a great situation to be in uh, for East Antarctica. Uh, but just in the last few days, actually, a new study has come out that suggests that actually one of the reasons for, for that disagreement has been an underestimate of the amount of snowfall in Antarctica uh, that affects um, one of those measurement types. And so if you actually uh, do a better job, of, of, uh, model the snowfall at much higher resolution, uh, down at sort of what, a couple of kilometres scale, actually it, it, it suggests that actually it snows more in Antarctica um, and actually uh, as a result of that, the, um, some of those lower estimates are shifted up towards the rest of the group um, uh, and suggesting actually now we have a pretty good idea and that we should have actually very good confidence in that we understand how Antarctica is changing, not just the whole Antarctic ice sheet, but the uh, subcomponents thereof. Uh, so we know uh, uh, what is happening with these ice sheets with some confidence now. Uh, this is a, uh, an animation of the changing mass of the ice sheet. It's from a satellite mission known as GRACE. Uh, it me measures at relatively low spatial resolution, but monthly time scales, how the Antarctic is changing. And as the red colours emerge, you see the areas that are losing mass into the ocean and contributing to sea level. You see the big bulge on the left-hand side of the graph, but also often to the Antarctic Peninsula in the, in the top left-hand corner. But you also see the oranges start to appear from East Antarctica as well on the, on the right-hand side, uh, indicating that that area is starting to lose mass. Um, we see some blues emerge in the top of the figure, uh, suggesting that there's increased snowfall in those areas. Um, but this is where I return to that point that looking at the whole Num the, the, the number as a whole of Antarctica or a whole of the ice sheet, you miss these details because it's when these coastal areas where they've got large glaciers um, draining into the ocean, when they start to change, then something is really happening uh, here. And it's generally going to be as a result of the ocean uh, forcing the ice sheet. Um, we see the same pat patterns uh, from other measurement techniques. So this is a map of elevation change uh, from space of the ice sheet. The last one was mass change from uh, measuring from Earth's gravity. Uh, and we see the same areas seeing the same sorts of signals. So uh, not just as a whole of ice sheet level, but actually at the regional level, we actually have agreement between these techniques about the areas that are changing. And we see again these coastal margins where there are large outlet glaciers um, uh, seem to be thinning, losing mass, driving up sea level. Uh, and in many cases, uh, not so long ago, they were changing much less than they are now. Um, uh, now, there, it would be also fair to say that um, the precise record that we have from the satellite measurements is only of the order um, 30 years long, 20 years in some cases, 30 years in others. Um, and that's a relatively short time to be trying to separate out short-term variations in climate from long-term uh, trends. And I'll come back to that topic later on. The key thing that is going to change Antarctica is the ocean. Um, the ocean, the Southern Ocean has been storing huge amounts of heat um, for now decades, um, uh, about 70% uh, of um, uh, heating has been going into the ocean, uh, in the, into the Southern Ocean. Um, and so that heat has been stored up. It's, it's heat that's in the ocean that's not in the atmosphere and has, that's been offsetting climate change globally. Um, but now we actually have the situation of if the heat can get to the ice, then the ice will melt and it will melt faster. Um, and one of the keys to whether the heat will get in the ocean will get to the ice is what, what the shape of the seafloor is. Um, uh, through which that warm water can pass. Um, and one of the sad um, uh, uh, situations that we have at the moment, actually with um, understanding the Antarctic ice sheet and how it might change in the future, is we have in some places very few samples of data along the continental margin that would tell us whether there are these deep troughs that warm water can pass through. Um, you can see that you know in the sort of mid-Southern Ocean, uh, here in the in the red colours, there's there's been a lot of cruises where they've sampled, uh, measured the seafloor bathymetry, uh, the shape of the ocean, 
But when you look at the areas along the margin of the ice sheet, there's a lot of blue, particularly in East Antarctica, indicating that actually there have only been one or two or three or four voyages into these areas. And I raise this um, simply because in what I will talk to, uh, about in a moment, um, uh, this should always cause us to be cautious uh, about what Antarctica could do in the future because um, there's a lot we don't know, but the things that we are finding out do seem to be going in the one direction, uh, that Antarctica, uh, the more we find out, the faster it changes um, and the more we expect it to change in the future. Um, the other thing is that low resolution data of this kind tends to smear out the deep, the deep troughs. And so we miss out uh, on that uh, deep information and that's the deep troughs of which the, the warm water can pass through uh, and get to the ice sheet. This is one area where we do have uh, high resolution imagery from just a few years ago off, off the, um, the Van der Fee Glacier and the, um, one of the maiden test voyage of the Australia's new icebreaker, Noyena, um, where it is mapped, this uh, deep trough shown in the top right hand corner, um, uh, uh, going down to uh, a couple of kilometres below sea level. Um, and that is a pathway potentially for warm water to travel along get to the glacier and melt it back. And in fact, when we look at the, um, the point of um, uh, where the glacier comes afloat and map that over time, we see that it's retreated by about 20 kilometres over the last two decades. So this glacier is retreating, it's thinning, it's behaving anonymously, uh, anomalously, uh, and it has a very deep trough that until recently wasn't mapped. And the, the concern that we have is that there are many more of these deep troughs that are just waiting to be activated by the ocean and hence melt back the East Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, if we can look at uh, the, the situation of uh, grounding line retreat uh, for, um, uh, or retreat in advance for a number of other glaciers, um, we see that there are a number of glaciers in, in blue in recent decades that have shown retreat in East Antarctica and retreat actually at rates that are not too dissimilar to the sort of maximum rates that were observed uh, over the paleo time. Now, those rates were sustained over thousands of years, uh, but we are seeing substantial change in parts of Antarctica, uh, enough change to make us quite concerned about what's going on. Um, one of the other things that has uh, emerged just in actually in the last uh, year or two is that warm water seems to be encroaching towards Antarctica. So we have deep troughs, some of them not mapped, um, but we know that there is actually increasingly warm water moving from further away to, to, from the ice towards the ice, uh, and it will start to access the ice along those deep troughs uh, increasingly over time. Here we see around the coast of uh, East Antarctica a lot more red than blues, um, indicating that in those areas there's been a profound warming of the ocean uh, along the continental margin. Uh, and that isn't compatible with uh, a stable ice sheet. Um, now, those of you who are uh, astute uh, observers of time series would have noticed um, there's a bunch of bumps and wiggles in, the, in this time series of mass change. It doesn't just go down as a straight line. There are periods where even for short periods of time, uh, the ice sheet might have grown overall. Um, uh, uh, and so we set about uh, trying to look into that and we were uh, interested in, in exactly what was causing those bumps and wiggles, but also what's behind the trend. Um, this is where the AR6, uh, the IPCC AR6 was um, uh, not very confident about what was driving the change in, uh, in Antarctica, stating that there was low confidence in, in attributing the causes of observed mass loss um, from the Antarctic ice sheet since 1993. Um, there were some process-based studies that indicated it. Um, uh, nonetheless, if you asked a survey of the, uh, the global community, most people, I think, probably would assume that uh, a lot of this was human-induced uh, climate change. Um, fortunately, since the AR6, um, there has been some more evidence that, that, uh, that actually helps resolve this uncertainty. Um, uh, a paper, uh, for a couple of papers from 2022 uh, suggest while the retreat in West Antarctica and the Amundsen Sea abatement might have been naturally triggered in the 1940s. It failed to recover, probably because of human-induced warming since the 1960s uh, and also human-induced ozone depletion since the 1980s. Um, simulations, very recent simulations of ocean warming in that area 
um, have certainly partly been driven, um, they suggest, by anthropogenic forcing. Uh, so there's studies that are continuing to emerge that actually confirms perhaps what most uh, Antarctic scientists regarded as likely uh, that humans were driving uh, at least a significant portion of the ice sheet change. There's still a lot to do uh, in this area, and that I think should also cause us um, to um, take a cautionary approach to what we do with the climate system in East Antarctica, given the amount of information that we still don't have. Um, so we're interested in the bumps and wiggles as well, uh, and uh, we're interested in, in how they uh, responded to El Nino Southern Oscillation, uh, and, and uh, many people are familiar with these in terms of droughts and floods in uh, either South America or Australia, um, depending on what, uh, what mode or phase those are in. Um, another mode of variability in the climate system is the Southern Annular Mode, which is really a contraction and expansion of the westerly winds that go around Antarctica. The interesting thing about the Southern Annular Mode is that it's been moving towards its positive phase. The winds have been contracting around Antarctica since the 1940s, and that is almost entirely driven by humans. So if we were to find a Southern Annular Mode fingerprint in Antarctic change, then it would suggest that actually uh, maybe there is a human component to the change. And so that's what we set out to look for. Um, and we found in this recent study we published just this year um, uh, an indication that actually maybe 40% of the mass loss over the last two decades was attributable to the Southern Annular Mode moving into its positive phase. Um, and because that was that moving towards its positive phase and this contraction of the westerly winds around Antarctica, maybe that uh, uh, because uh, that is caused by human ozone depletion and greenhouse gases, um, then there might be a pathway here to open up uh, an attribute, um, something of the order of a few tens of percent of Antarctica's change to human activities associated mainly with snowfall changes. The other point I wanted to make is that surprises are emerging from Antarctica that causes uh, has caused people to be uh, surprised, and by people I mean scientists being gobsmacked by what they're seeing. Um, this was a uh, model prediction study from uh, our team uh, earlier in the year, uh, published in Nature, uh, where they projected that sometime by middle of the century, um, the formation of uh, some of the waters that form part of the global overturning circulation um, would have slowed by the order of 40%. Now, uh, the animation on the left um, sort of is a simplistic representation of that, but you can see where warm, uh, where waters are being formed and being distributed, and that actually uh, form part of a global system. Uh, these warm, uh, these waters uh, transport heat, they transport nutrients, they transport oxygen. These are the things of life in the ocean. Um, and our team identified you know, in a model projection that these would start to slow by about 42% by the middle of the century. Then within a three months, there were two papers published, which were observational papers that were looking at exactly this topic. And actually both of them identified that already this production had slowed by 30% in two of the two, two of the four areas in Antarctica. So the observations were decades ahead of the model projection. Uh, and uh, we are already seeing a slowdown in the production of these waters, and this will have consequences uh, for decades and centuries to come in terms of the distribution of heat, nutrient, wow. nutrients and oxygen in the global oceans. The other, uh, another surprise uh, was the uh, dramatic reduction of uh, Antarctic sea ice since uh, 2017, but particularly this year where um, uh, you don't need to be a climate scientist to work out that the red line is just very, very different to um, what we had observed over the last 40 years. Um, uh, um, it's not often that scientists start to use or try to use uh, variants of the word flabbergasted constantly, but uh, our best of our best um, CI scientists simply couldn't understand what was going on, couldn't believe their eyes at what they were seeing. Um, and uh, another example of a surprise coming at us um, and the sea ice plays an incredibly important role for the global climate system, re reflecting um, energy back into space, um, uh, uh, pr helping produce the overturning circulation that I talked about as it forms and um, as the sea ice forms. 
uh, the ecosystem dependence on it, uh, the krill that feeds sort of at the bottom of the food chain, all of these things, depending on sea ice. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would be fair to say that um, my team and others around the, the globe are really very concerned about what they're seeing here um, in, and, and actually very concerned about what's going to happen in the future. Um, you could look at that graph and say, well, by the end of 2023, it's sort of caught up to where the um, where the trend was, but that sea ice will be in the main um, thinner than usual and primed to melt faster than usual. And we would expect that curve to drop uh, very quickly, uh, more quickly than usual. Um, uh, colleagues um, in Australia have um, have noted that uh, the, the sea ice extent shown in the top right hand corner here um, was perhaps uh, growing a little bit over uh, 30 years or so, then it seemed to move into a, um, a high state where there was more sea ice than normal. Um, and then it fell off a cliff in, in about 2017 and again in, in 2022 where it's entered a new phase. And the, and the bottom plot is one of the oceanography profiles um, suggesting that actually it is a new state and that the ocean is um, uh, structured in a different way. It's warmer than normal, it's certainly the surface. Something has changed uh, and uh, the concern is uh, what comes next. Um, another surprise, this is, this, you know, we're all within 12 or 18 months of each other, a 40 degree heat wave in March 2022. Um, the air temperatures uh, didn't really breach zero because it was cold enough, but this is a, a, a heat wave uh, covering a, an area of East Antarctica larger than India. Um, and uh, uh, just in any other place on Earth, we would uh, just would not be able to understand what we were experiencing with a 40 degree heat wave. Um, unprecedented in the last 40 years. It's possible that it's occurred before. Um, but these are things that we don't know about Antarctica uh, that keep coming at us, and that's part of the story. We don't know everything about this place, and that should cause us to be cautious. Um, a few days later, the Conger Ice Shelf, fortunately not a super consequential ice shelf, uh, but a few, you know, 10 kilometres by 20 kilometres, um, maybe 200 metres thick, um, uh, broke up in the matter of days splintered into a million icebergs. Um, but even then, uh, that, would, that would affect the local ecosystems. Uh, the iceberg production will change the lo local oceans. Um, uh, this might be the beginning of a more substantial uh, change of this sort in the future, as we would expect to see uh, larger and more consequential ice shelves break up. Um, and uh, stop holding back the ice that's upstream and hence uh, allow for greater sea level contribution. And as we um, move through to think about the future, um, I do so saying that actually the best of our models can't reproduce always what we're seeing and often Antarctica is changing at a faster rate than the models project. Um, uh, for example, if you take the map in the bottom right-hand corner and left-hand side underneath the observations there, you see areas that are changing present day quite dramatically in Antarctica. Um, the models used in the uh, IPCC projections don't reproduce the changes in all of those areas. Uh, in fact, in some of those areas, they suggest that actually there's no change um, going on. And so that should lead us, to, while this is the best available and these are uh, really state-of-the-art models, it should cause us again to be cautious because things are happening faster than we expect them to happen and our theoretical understanding is lacking. Um, if you uh, have a look at the time series of projection in the top right hand side, you see the observations for the first few decades and then the projections take over. You see some projections actually suggest the Antarctic ice sheet will grow slightly. Um, most of them suggest that Antarctica will contribute um, uh, to sea level over this coming century. You'll see that there's a significant uncertainty. That uncertainty depends largely on the climate forcing that we as humans decide to place on it. Um, but there are other uncertainties in terms of we just don't know all the physical processes. They're not all captured in the models yet. Um, uh, but I, I'm hoping to convince you that actually we should expect that number perhaps to get worse given, that, uh, given the, the, um, the number of processes that are not captured. Um, the potential future uh, in the long term, and here we're talking about 
um, effectively permanent on human time scales uh, effects on Antarctica. Um, well, we can perhaps have an insight from that from looking at the mid Pliocene warm period in the bottom left hand side, the last in the glacial, where we see Antarctica not looking like it looks now. Substantial areas of deglaciation, um, possibly adding um, many, many metres to sea level. We can see this in, in this series of projections uh, where we first see um, uh, uh, a projection for one and a half degree climate out to um, 2100 uh, in the in the blues. You can see there the Antarctic ice sheet contributing about 0.1 of a metre. Um, that's still going to flood millions of people and it permanently affects their, their, their livelihoods and their homes, uh, their social structures. Um, and actually the, the, the rate of sea level rise is sort of still sort of increasing through that period of time, but it does buy people time from the worst of it. If you go out to 2300 at one and a half degrees, you see you get to about a metre of sea level rise, um, but it's when you contrast it with um, say three degrees of warming, uh, which is certainly within play at the moment, we see sea level rise from Antarctica uh, of about one and a half metres by 2300. Um, and in the really high scenarios, heading towards 10 metres of sea level uh, and some model projections out to 15 metres of sea level by 2300. So we really want it, we don't want to be in this space. Um, we want to keep uh, Antarctica pretty much as it is. And the one and a half degree scenario is our best chance of getting there. Um, that's, uh, I'm going to skip over that slide because that hasn't quite worked out. Um, uh, there's been some recently, um, some model scenarios of the ocean in that key area of West Antarctica that I mentioned, the Amundsen Sea Embayment, um, where uh, the model looks at um, ocean warming uh, in that area over the, the, the next century, um, uh, associated with uh, one and a half degrees, that's in the blue, um, uh, two degrees in the green um, and, and greater warming in the other colours. And you can see that the one and a half degree scenario, while it still warms the ocean in that area, it's the one that breaks stride the earliest and by a significant margin. One and a half degrees provides a distinct advantage and, a, uh, and actually uh, a hope that the Antarctic ice sheet um, will change slower um, than the other scenarios. The other important thing to, to, to note is that um, ice sheets are good at melting, they're slow at forming. And we can see that in the climate uh, record from the past over the last 150,000 years or so here, where the decay from the peak um, uh, is generally slower. Um, uh, and so that's the forming of the ice sheet as the sea level's lower, um, but actually the rising of the sea levels, the melting of the ice sheets happens a factor of, I don't know, two or three faster here in this figure, um, melting is much easier than growing an ice sheet. Uh, and we are dealing with things that can't be put back in human timescales. So I really wanted to stop uh, with this figure again, um, that uh, we don't want to mess with 52 metres or 58 metres of sea level rise. Changes are already underway. Humans may not have driven all of that change. But at some stage, the human forcing and the ice sheet response will take over as the dominant signal if it hasn't already. Um, we know that there's increased snowfall over parts of Antarctica. That's consistent with ocean warming uh, and increased uh, uh, capacity for the atmosphere to hold uh, moisture. And when it gets to Antarctica, it snows more. We know that there's increased flow and melt. Um, we know that there's increased warming of the oceans around Antarctica. Um, and in many cases, it's faster than we can reproduce in our best models. Uh, and to me, all of that uncertainty suggests that we should be cautious about Antarctica uh, and we shouldn't be playing dice with it. Uh, and with that, I shall finish. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to take questions. Yes. With what confidence can you say that the heat wave in 2020 of course very up in the wrong direction? Uh, look, I, I, I think it's it could be pure coincidence. Uh, I think there has been some work that suggested uh, a mechanistic aspect. Um, 
it was it's been it, that was retreating and collapsing slowly over decades um it may well have been a final straw that broke the camel's back uh situation it might have been a straight coincidence and i dare say we may never know because it was one of those places that no one ever really went to it was poorly understood to begin with um uh but um it's the sort of thing that we will expect in the future. So it's a visual aid for us to understand that actually dramatic things happen in Antarctica. Um, it isn't, uh, and actually even just a few decades ago, scientists thought Antarctica was a pretty boring place that slow, you know, changed over thousands of years. And within two or three decades, we've realized that actually things can change overnight in Antarctica. Uh, and that's just a good reminder for me that actually that's the case, yeah. How strong do you think um, awareness is amongst overseas makers of all of this? I mean, there's been a lot in the media about the sea ice and so on, but is that message getting across to where the media is to be? Look, I, th I think Antarctica is very long way down the list of people's thinking uh, when it comes to climate change. I think there's a sense of it's a long way away. Uh, yes, uh, we sort of broadly understand something about sea level change. But I really don't think they understand that every day uh, a slice of Antarctica laps up against our shorelines, um, that uh, right now, today, Antarctica is slowing the global overturning circulation, the thing that makes our climate the way it is. Um, um, so that I, I'd say there's a very limited exposure uh, to that, um, to the ice sheet, to the oceans, but to the ice sheet, absolutely. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, more than happy to wrap it up there. Thank you very much.